Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrafish plant and cell based seafood webinar, a threat or opportunity. We're very happy to have everyone joining. Uh, we are giving just a few minutes for people to hop in, but we need to get things underway uh, so that we can uh, get right to our, uh, to our discussions. Um, plant and cell based seafood is something that's been on the Intrafish radar and the industry's radar for, for quite a while now. And the discussion both internally and, uh, and externally has been whether or not the seafood industry should see this as competitor, as partner, uh, whether it should be seen as a threat to market share. And so today we're really, really excited to, uh, to discuss that. And, uh, and uh, we've got, uh, again, a great lineup of speakers to, uh, to chat about that. Just this morning in preparation for this, I took a look at the uh, market shares of uh, seafood companies and some of the, uh, uh, some of the other uh, protein companies, including Beyond Meat. Um, first quarter earnings are coming out, and so it's, uh, it's hard to say exactly uh, what the impact will be on, uh, on alternative proteins. But, uh, but Beyond Meat now is an $8 billion company, and that puts it just below uh, movie, uh, which is the world's most valuable seafood company at $9 billion. So it's by no means a small sector. There's expectations that the plant-based sector will be, uh, will be growing to some $140 billion uh, within the coming years. Um, and that puts it more than uh, the U.S. Uh, seafood sector that is uh, up around $100 billion. So as of now, plant-based seafood, though, is a very, very small part of, uh, of the sector. It's a, it's a very limited part of, uh, of, of the industry, both in the U.S. Uh, and in the, the rest of the Western world uh, and, and Asia. But we have seen some major entrants uh, into the sector, and we've got uh, some of those folks with us today. So I'm going to go ahead and get, uh, get the introductions going so that we can, uh, can get, things, uh, get things underway. Just a quick bit of house cleaning up in your right-hand corner. You should be able to see a little box there with a red arrow and, and some options. Uh, one of those options is a chat function where you can ask questions. Um, John Fiorillo, executive editor of Intrafish, is going to be moderating this session, but I'll be in the background uh, looking at those questions. And then at the end, uh, I will uh, be able to direct a few of those at the panel. So please participate. Um, please ask any questions. Uh, we're also covering this live on Intrafish.com. Uh, and we'll have uh, video and, uh, and other coverage uh, after the event as well. So uh, getting our panel uh, off and running. So first off, as I mentioned, we have our moderator, John Fiorello with Intrafish, who's going to be uh, handling today's events. We also have Roger O'Brien. He's the president and CEO of Santa Monica Seafood. We have Lou Cooper House, the president and CEO of Blue Nalu. Uh, Jos Matiasen, the investment director at Nutreco Ventures. Chad Sarno, he's a co-founder and senior VP of culinary at Gathered Foods Corp. And we have Dominique Barnes, the co-founder of New Wave Foods. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John and he's going to get the discussion started. So thanks again, speakers. Looking forward to a very, very interesting discussion. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear OK? Yes. All right. Yep. Well, I want to welcome the panel and our listeners to what we think will be a very informative and exciting um, seminar, webinar on uh, plant-based and cell-based uh, foods. It's one of the hottest trends in the food sector right now, and uh, it's impacting every other protein from poultry to beef to seafood. So we're going to dive right in, and um, I'd like to ask Yost first if he could kind of frame for us um, the situation as far as a global protein shortage. Nutreco monitors uh, these types of things and you know your your company is very involved in animal protein and animal nutrition. So if you could kind of tell us how big of a deficit we think is coming in animal protein um, 
for the world and what your company foresees as the what it needs to do. Sure. So thanks, John. Um, indeed, so Nutraco is engaged in, in um, uh, the production of animal feed and we're very much a supplier to the animal protein value chain. And that's, I think, the defining challenge that we're faced with um, is to supply enough nutritious protein um, you know, for the world. Um, and the population is growing very rapidly. Uh, we'll be you know, nine, uh, at least, and potentially 10 billion people um, by, uh, by 2050. All these people need to eat, um, and these people are, you know, are also eating uh, relatively more protein per capita. So uh, demand is increasing very rapidly. Um, whereas you know the, the the world's resources are limited, right? So the number of uh, available land for um, for growing proteins, including animal proteins, is limited, um, and it's shrinking rather than than increasing. Um, so I think that's that's a, a very uh, very strong challenge that we face there, and I think that's also sets a bit of the backdrop for for our commitments. So we see ourselves as a provider, an input provider to that um, to that value chain, um, but you know with with protein as as the key output. That's also why we're embracing new technologies, uh, new inputs of, of getting to that same uh, same level of nutritious uh, protein outputs. And you're partnering partnering with Blue Nalu. What what did you see in that company that made you decide that you know it, it was the right company to partner with in the uh, in the cell based food sector? Um, I think overall. Um, you know, we, we see um, in, in light of that, that protein challenge, our, our mission is defined broadly as, as feeding the future. So we're looking for into broadly into new technologies that could feed the future. And that's it, it's livestock. It could be aquaculture farming. It could be novel aquaculture farming like land based. And it could be alternative food proteins. Um, and then cell based is one of the options, right? Plant based is, is, is another. And you could look into fermentation based technologies as well. Um, what we look for is is great technology, um, is, um, is is vision, is ambition, is a great team and a roadmap to execute on that. Um, cell based is inherently uh, a, a very uh, exciting technology with lots of potential um, to to be really be a factor in the overall protein supply situation. Uh, but there's many challenges that remain um, on the technological, regulatory, consumer acceptance fronts, to name just a few. Um, and we were very excited about, you know, Lou and his team and their ability to, um, you know, formulate that vision, to develop their technology, uh, and to uh, make really meaningful steps um, on that journey towards scaling. So uh, that's a partnership that we're particularly excited about, and um, we look forward to uh, to learning more from uh, as it goes along. You'll you tell us about a question. Um, oh, when when you talk about uh, protein concerns, isn't it rather geographic specific? Because everything I read tells me that. Uh, both North and South America should have significant protein surpluses for years to come. It's really primarily China. Yeah, they're the largest uh, by land side, largest by population. China has the protein uh, concern as well as uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So sure, sure, yeah. It's a, the average the average view per location, right? I think the overall challenge is 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 there. So there is a, a global protein shortage, and that and that's what driving the challenge. But th that's not balanced equally across geographies. So indeed, there are some countries that have a huge surplus and others that have a deficit. Right. I think what we're now also realizing is that that supply chain is fairly global, right? And that has severe limitations. So I think that's also interesting to see how that develops going forward in light of COVID, where there will be more localization and more um, uh, you know, focus on national food security and things like that. Potentially, that's a, that's a, that's a, a tailwind for, for alternative protein as well. Um, but I think, um, 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 as you say, there's there's some companies which are challenges even for countries which are challenges even greater than others. Hey Lou, could you walk us through cell-based seafood in this case? How, what is it? What do you uh, do? You create a whole fish? Do you create a little portion of fish from a cell? Just uh, I think our listeners would benefit from understanding what that process is and how far away from reality. Um, you are at this moment. Yeah, thanks, John. Yes, cell-based seafood is um, uh, a, a process in which we take uh, some cells from uh, the, the actual portions uh, that we typically consume. So muscle cells, fat cells, or connective tissue cells are isolated and then propagated in large volumes from the actual fish uh, and essentially reconstructed back into a fish fillet 
we're not making a living fish we're making so it's, it's a bit uh, uh, kind of similar in, in logically if you will to in vitro fertilization of a human it's we're making a fish but not a living person in this case or a living fish but it's fish tissue that's made outside the body if you will um, we're growing them what will ultimately be large stainless steel uh, tanks it looks a little bit to the eye like a microbrewery um, that then uh, is, is growing these cells, the muscle cells, fat cells, connected tissue cells, uh, again, in really large volumes, uh, and then assembling them back into the fish tissue, the same nutritional composition, the same genetic uh, identity, the same functional characteristics, and the same great taste as, as conventional fish. So again, uh, as Yost was mentioning, it's, uh, it's another solution. You know, say we have uh, consumers have a, an option for wild uh, caught or farm raised and cell base will be a third solution for fish that is functionally nutritionally the same as as conventional fish products and how much could a typical plant produce uh, tonnage wise do we do we know that yet yeah and and also to answer your earlier question so we're, we're only about a year and a half away uh, 18 months away or so from being a test market a um, you know, large scale production would, would come a few years after that. So we might be maybe five years away from seeing a first large scale factory. And we've estimated that each large scale operation can produce somewhere between 10 to 20 million pounds per year. But again, as, uh, as we evolve our, our engineering and our design uh, criteria, we hopefully can do even greater than that. But our whole model, John, is to be really demand driven you know, today, our whole global seafood supply is very supply driven. Um, we, in fact, can can create, you know, these uh, factories for cell based seafood that are located maybe 50 or 100 miles away from population centers and create a consistent supply chain, um, you know, and, and really take out some of the variability that exists today in in uh, uh, in, 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 in having uh, a consistent supply. So it's really something that um, we're pretty excited by. Um, but we, we see factories that could obviously be located around the world, obviously focusing first in North America. Yeah, okay. John, John can I ask Lou the question? Um, you're gonna start off with lab production. How difficult do you see converting over to large scale commercial production? And having been on your website and reading articles, why is that still five years away? The technology's never been done before, Roger. So, so this is uh, you know, like any, any food industry, and I come from 35 years in the food industry, you know, we're, what, what we're doing is working on the bench like anybody else in R&D, and then we're doing pilot production so that you, the year and a half from now is really pilot production is doing several hundred pounds per week. Um, and that actually helps us, you know, get into, uh, uh, into commerce, frankly. And, uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the challenges that this industry is having, has, ha has had, is ha has not been approved uh, by a regulatory agency in the U.S. or anywhere in the world. So we, we, we have confidence that this will be, you know, this will be approved by the FDA sometime uh, in the second half of 2021. But then, you know, like anything else, we, we prove the, the commercialization capability. We really uh, optimize the design engineering and then we have the confidence to build large scale production. Then it becomes a bit of a cookie cutter process to build factories around the world. But, you know, we obviously want to be cautious. It has not been done before. Um, and there's a lot of engineering milestones ahead of us, but we're pretty confident that we'll get there uh, in that period of time. Dominique, you're, you were co-founder of New Wave, and I'm curious um, to learn from you what consumer trends you saw that prompted you to uh, co-found New Wave, and what, what on the consumer end is driving this demand for plant and cell-based uh, foods. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, you know, I started the company five years ago, and you, then it was just the beginnings of this huge trend in plant-based. You know, the plant-based alternatives have been around for a long time, but the quality of products weren't there. And you had your true believers, but you didn't see crossover into mainstream uh, adoption. You're not seeing your seafood eaters or your meat food eaters eating these alternatives on a regular basis. But at that time, it was when Impossible Food to be on meat and Hampton Creek, which is now just, just raised considerable amount of financing through venture capital, which signaled to me that this is a, a growing trend. And at that time, there really wasn't a new player on the table for plant-based seafood. Um, there were clearly a lot of terrestrial and milk companies coming out doing alternative 
plant-based products, but nobody looking at seafood quite yet. I think that some of them maybe have been under wraps. And for me thinking about if someone is going to try a plant-based seafood, what are they going to try first? And it's probably something that's familiar, maybe familiar with the twist. And so I knew that shrimp was our fate here in the US and many other countries. And so why not go after a really convincing shrimp alternative? So I felt like that was aligned with what I was seeing in the plant-based market where you had impossible getting the burger that bleeds. Well, let's get the shrimp that tastes like a shrimp, but it's made from plant ingredients. So I think uh, quality of the product and authenticity in terms of matching the thing it's trying to replicate. I think she froze. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll hop over to Chad real quick. Uh, Chad, you have a culinary background, um, and I'm wondering of uh, the plant-based foods that you see out there in addition to Good Catch, how do they compare one nutritionally to um, seafood? And, you know, from a sensory uh, point of view as well. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as Dominique had mentioned over the past few years, there has not been, uh, there hasn't been a lot of products out there that have really um, held held that high bar. And, you know, I think it, it was really blown open with Impossible and, and Beyond and the opportunities there. Um, but I think, uh, you know, in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, two to 300 types of sea creatures out there, you know, and, and, you know, 30 land animals that are being consumed. And the, the plant-based meat market is, is growing exponentially, as you mentioned. And, and so I think that there's a huge opportunity uh, when it comes to innovation. And this is what excites me around innovation. There's a huge opportunity within the seafood sector, because if you look at all these species that we consume around the world from the oceans, you know, as Dominique had mentioned, it's not even being touched. So we started this company about, you know, um, almost four years ago uh, with Good Catch Foods, Gathered Foods being our parent company, and, you know, looking to looking to really, uh, you know, embrace these consumer trends, you know, and, and from a culinary standpoint, I'll, I'll always come from a culinary standpoint. I'm a chef, I'm a chef by trade for years. And so, um, so the taste experience in, uh, is first and foremost, um, you know, um, uh, pushing our, our innovation. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, we, we also look at price awareness, convenience and taste. Those are the, really the four buckets that we've, that we've um, you know, approach the development of this company. And so taste we're leading with, um, awareness is just around the, around the company and the brand. And, um, um, you know, in terms of price, we are, we are, uh, you know, opening up our factory in about a month now out of Heath, Ohio. Uh, we're going to be, um, launching our frozen items within about a month or so, which is very exciting. And then convenience is, this is, this is where our, our partnership with Bumblebee comes in. So, you know, making it accessible to a lot more households, you know, so, uh, but in terms of the innovation side, I mean, as I mentioned, all of those species of, of sea creatures that are out there, it hasn't it hasn't really been touched. I mean, it's uh, it's a very exciting time for plant based, and uh, it's a very exciting time for innovation and R and D as well in this space. Can Can you give us a little insight into that bumblebee relationship? Um, how it might work? Is it a straight distribution type of arrangement or? It is currently, yeah. So they uh, they actually sought us out, which is which has been amazing, and um, we've just grown to absolutely love that team over there. And I mean, it's a legacy brand, as you know. And so um, they have, you know, they they, you know, if you look at if you look at uh, I had mentioned, you know, plant based meat space. Um, you know, you have Tyson, you have Cargill, you have you have Maple Leaf, you have PHW. Um, PHW is over in Europe. They're one of our first investors. Um, Maple Leaf came in recently into the recent round, and they 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 know that the trends are changing. You know, they know that buying trends are changing, and so you know, I was speaking to the the, the CEO of Maple Leaf a number of months back, and he had mentioned, you know, we are no longer a meat company. We are a protein company. And it is, I mean, to be able to diversify your portfolio so that you can meet all these channels and all these demands um, is absolutely smart from a business standpoint, as we can all agree. And so I think um, I think Bumblebee saw that. So Bumblebee saw that from the get-go. And so they sought us out and, uh, and you know, being able to diversify their portfolio, um, you know, with uh, protein, you know, that is ocean-centric is, uh, is where they're going with, with uh, with their offerings and that we're just, we're thrilled to have the, the partnership with them. And 
um, it is, it is uh, you know, John, answer your question. Um, it is uh, a distribution partnership and, um, you know, and we're hoping that will be a, a very long-term play as well. So we're happy to, very happy to have them as partners, so. Roger, I want to ask you about the industry's feelings towards, uh, in this case, plant-based right now, cell-based will be coming uh, a little later on. But um, as you and I have talked about and we reported, you know, the industry has started off uh, a little weary of, of this. And um, since then, some some big players, Bumblebee, for example, have kind of jumped aboard. So give us a sense of uh, the industry's take on, on this trend right now. Well, I'm not surprised by Bumblebee jumping in. I, I, think, I think it's very natural. They're a billion dollar company and all the large billion dollar um, food companies, I don't care if they're seafood or not, um, it's what they do. It's what they have to do. Uh, none of them can afford to, you know, miss the next unicorn, if you will. They're all hoping to hit a, a deck of corn or a hectacorn for that matter. Um, if, if they don't participate in some of these new innovative ventures and one turns into a unicorn uh, and they didn't jump in, especially if it's their industry, uh, goodbye day job. Um, they're out of the picture. They missed it. Um, I, I haven't talked to Jan Tharp at uh, uh, Bumblebee Foods, the CEO there, but I know she's very smart. She has a lot of vision. And um, I think she can figure out how to distinguish between her traditional products and any new products that she gets involved in. Uh, but from the industry's perspective, um, I think they're both fascinating stories. I think they're both innovative. And I think they both have a place in the food chain, be it retail, be it, be it food service. Um, if I look at cell-based, um, don't know a lot about it. I know it's still uh, far off, it's coming. Uh, most of my research, I'll be honest, um, I found Blue, Blue Nay Lou. I have a hard, hard time with this one, Lou. Blue Nay Lou. Uh, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I've been on your website. I like the mission statement, but more importantly, I absolutely loved the stated principles that were there. I also found some commentary by your uh, ex-chairman, one of the founders, uh, who's, who's spoken up heavily about it uh, through Interfish primarily. I agree with all of his comments. Um, I think it has a fascinating story to tell. I think it's it could well be a huge opportunity for the seafood industry. But I need to know how the product's produced. Uh, I know there are good ways to produce it, and then there are bad ways like genetic modification, which we don't like. Um, I have to know what the reagents are used in the chemical process. I have to know what the non-seafood additives are that will be added to get the texture and the taste and the appearance, and how those reagent chemicals and the additives impact the nutrition of the product. Uh, I need to know what the nomenclature is for this because I you know, hear different words all the time. I'm not sure you've settled on one yet. Uh, I need to know how you're gonna label the products to the extent they end up in retail packages. And I need to know what the marketing approach is. But if the approach towards labeling, uh, nutrition, and marketing is similar to all the press I've read, at least about your company, I think it could be a huge opportunity. Um, plant-based products, first I have to say that I've been following plant-based imitation uh, proteins, or, or proteins, excuse me, uh, for probably the last nine months. Most of that has been in the imitation meat sector because that's where it started really. Uh, imitation seafood on the plant-based side has been the Johnny come lately. And, um, I know we have two panelists that are from two different companies uh, in that sector. Um, I've been on both your websites, but my research of your companies has been rather minor. Uh, and my comments are more directed to plant-based foods in general. Um, I know that there are good companies and bad companies in every industry. Uh, Lord knows that the traditional seafood industry has its share of both. Uh, we try to be one of the good companies and I hope you both are as well. And good companies need to be instruments for change because every industry needs constant improvement. Um, to say you're there, that's an elusive goal. It's not going to happen. So to be an instrument for change to make them better, that's a good thing. And I hope that's what you are. But on a general basis, when I look at plant-based imitation seafood, I see it as a threat to the industry. Four main reasons. And hopefully we'll dig into each of these. 
Number one, my biggest issue is labeling. They call themselves seafood or tuna or shrimp or whatever. When this, it's not just misleading, but it's outright wrong in my opinion. They're not seafood. There's no fish in those products. I think that's the first threat. Uh, the second one is nutrition. These products are not nutritious. They are technically ultra processed foods if I use the NOVA um, uh, classification standards. And ultra processed foods are the highest and worst level of, um, of classification they have for processed foods. I don't think you'll find a nutritionist anywhere in the world who's gonna tell you that a processed food at any level is healthy and good for you. Uh, they typically contain anywhere from 20 to 40 ingredients. I love turning over packages and counting how many ingredients they have in them. Some of those ingredients are not healthy. Um, but my issue with the nutrition is by labeling themselves and pat, trying to pass themselves off as seafood and not being nutritious, they're giving seafood a bad name. The implication is that seafood is not healthy either. And I think just the opposite is true. So that's my second threat. Um, by misleading consumers into calling themselves seafood, I think they're trying to attract consumers who are looking for seafood. That makes them a competitor, which is fine. I don't mind competition at all, but I think they're not playing a fair game by doing that. Uh, that's the third threat. And last is what I'll call disparaging marketing against seafood and the industry. I've read lots of false comments about the industry, which I think is very hard for me to understand. They're hurting the products they're aspiring to be. I think that's extremely disingenuous. That's number four. But to wrap all those up together, I have one fix. Stop calling yourself seafood. Uh, fix the name, call it what it is. Um, uh, the top six ingredients in most of these, five or six ingredients in most of these products are various kinds of pea, bean, soy, protein. Yet, uh, unless you read the fine print on the back, nowhere on the front you see anything that ref is reflective of that. Um, fix the labeling, um, be a ve vegan product, which is what I think you are. I think you're a decent vegan product, don't get me wrong, but fix the labeling. I don't care about the nutrition factor at that point. And good luck uh, being in the food sector. Dominique, I want nice. to... Oh, sure. Go ahead, Chad. Then I'll go to you, Doug. Yeah, I would, I would, that's, those are great Thanks. points, Roger. Thank you very much for bringing those up. I would love to uh, to just kind of run through a couple of those and, you know, and for our stance, you know, I think labeling is a, that's a great conversation. But if you look at Shreemi, I mean, look at, look at imitation crab. You're still calling it crab and it's not. It's whitefish. We all know that. I mean, you look at, you know, parts of, parts of, you look at parts of China and you look at, you know, parts of India, canned tuna is 90% soy, you know, and it's still called tuna, correct? So, so the labeling issue, I think that we need to, it needs to be consistent across the board. If you're bringing up labeling with plant-based, then we should, uh, you know, we should play with similar terms on, on both sides. I agree with that. Um, so that's, that's one stance. And also it's, we're working with the confines of label regulations currently, which there there's not a lot currently around seafood. So, I mean, we, we are an ocean based product, which we use seaweeds, we use algae oils and we use algae extracts. Um, so that's the first point that you mentioned. The next one is uh, nutrition. Um, we've really focused closely on the nutrition of our products. So if you look at the nutrition panel of our tuna next to a can of tuna of our plant based next to a can of tuna, it's almost identical when it comes to protein levels. So we're at 19 to 23 grams of protein, which is right up there with albacore. We are, it is plant-based protein, right? And then we also are adding uh, DHA and algal oil and seaweeds and algae extracts to give you the, you know, 350 milligrams DHA EPA blend, right? So there's that piece, uh, also low in sodium, low in fat. The only difference really is that our product is not made out of fish, obviously, um, and it doesn't contain mercury, you know, and that's, uh, you know, if we're talking about labeling, then I think we need to be all transparent completely, even across the seafood industry of, you know, labeling that it, it contains mercury when it comes to tuna. So I think it's a fascinating discussion that, um, that can continue to go on. But when it comes to processed foods, you had mentioned there's a lot of these products 
that have you know 20 to 40 ingredients and that that's definitely true there's a lot of crap products within the industry i totally admit that but speaking for a good catch we intentionally have focused on clean ingredients if you turn over the back of one of our packets we have about eight ingredients eight to ten ingredients in the product and six of them are different beans so um so it's a six legume blend we're not focused on that single monocrop of soy we have uh soy pea chickpea uh navy bean fava and lentil also so so i think it's very misleading roger when you say that most of these products are packed with 20 to 40 ingredients um, and ultra processed so um, I understand that there's allergens out there to soy. I understand there's allergens coming out for pea as well. But if you look at, there's almost nine to 10 million seafood allergies in the U.S. So, um, so I think it's it's fair to say that if you look at the back of a lot of plant-based products, there are a lot of crap products, just like there are in every industry. But we have really focused on, you know, clean ingredients, which is we've really tried to address. Um, then the other piece is, um, you know, um, and you know, I'll, I'll pass it over to Dominique in a minute too here is uh, in terms of uh, being miss, uh, where, where was I? Where's that? my other notes here? Uh, disparaging marketing. I think that that is, you know, where there's an industry, there's an industry we're trying to be, um, you know, we're trying to be transparent with our marketing um, and taste is always focused. You know, it's a culinary experience. We, it's a one-to-one -one swap out for what people are used to with tuna. But if you look at the buying trends of consumers, you know, there's, I think it's around 32% are flexitarian shoppers within the US. And we have a, a huge presence over in the UK with my other company, Wiki Kitchen, and 68% of shoppers over there actively seeking meat alternatives. 68% of shoppers. And that number is from Tesco, which is one of our partners. Um, so to, uh, to look at, um, you know, the, the disparaging marketing, as you had mentioned, um, if a plant-based meat company is using a percentage of their workforce as as slavery on their ships uh we would like to be called out you know if we're if we're injecting mercury into our product we'd like to be called out you know i believe that customers need transparency you know and we are not you know every customer is going to have a different lever to purchase our product and to go in the direction of plant-based um that might be environmental concerns that might be um nutrition concerns that might be animal welfare uh, but we push culinary you know uh, so i think we play to all those levers and we're transparent with our marketing and i think that that's really important to add there so yeah and i wanted to follow that uh with a question for dominique because that is a thing you hear from the industry quite a bit it seems a lot of the marketing for plant-based right now initially points to shortcomings uh in the seafood sector overfishing etc and i know you have a background in marine um in the marine sector so could you talk a little bit about that maybe uh expand on chad and and um tell us what you think about that sure i you know my background is in uh marine biodiversity and conservation and prior to that i worked uh in aquarium care and i cared for seafood tanks and the resorts in Las Vegas, I was the one making sure the water quality, the fresh lobster tank, the ducks and everything was spot on. So at least that, that section of that life of that animal was clean going to the plate um, of the consumer. So I think that it's, it's not necessarily an attack. I think it's part of the discussion around seafood. Consumers do want transparency and that's always been a challenge with seafood. Um, it's, it's, it's so, so confusing. There's so many different variables. Is it is it wild caught better or is farm raised better? Does it have mercury? Doesn't have mercury? Where is it caught in the world? Even the labeling of the fish itself, talking about labeling, can get mixed up by the time it gets to your plate. So oftentimes when a consumer goes to a grocery store thinking they're going to buy one species, it could actually be something else, but they would never know. So the transparency and labeling within seafood itself has always been complex and challenging and a huge undertaking. Um, the, uh, platforms that have done a good job, in my opinion, of bringing to light good, better, best practices in seafood has been the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch. 
and just to partner with New Wave, um, excuse me, Monterey Bay Seafood Watch because we do use algae ingredients. They weren't interested in partnering with any plant-based seafood alternatives before because to Roger's point, that's not seafood. It doesn't include anything from the ocean. But a lot of us, especially at New Wave, I know at Ocean Hugger, it's important to have those marine components. Um, you know, I'm officially not with New Wave anymore, but it was my vision and still is, I believe, that algae is going to be something that saves the world, especially in terms of food. And for us, the goal was to get as close to as possible with 100% algae product, a marine algae product. So I think authenticity from that perspective is very clean, clear if it's a, a plant algae-based protein, color, flavor, pro, uh, fiber coming from the ocean in our products. So, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting time because before there was a clean, a clear light on seafood. A lot of did look at it as a great, healthy um, protein, a clean source of food. But as more of the industry's unsavory aspects come to light, then there's it clouds, uh, it clouds the industry and gives plant-based an opportunity to show, hey, there's other ways to bring seafood to the table that doesn't involve slavery, like it does in most of the shrimp or in a lot of the shrimp manufacturing over in Thailand. My, my expertise mostly is in the shrimp, you know, production world, and we get most of it imported 90% from aquaculture and that over an age. Uh-oh, she froze up again. I think she froze. Yeah. Well, Roger, I'm going to throw it to you real quick because okay. I guess my question would be to you as a seafood uh, supplier, why, what, what would prevent you or why wouldn't you partner with uh, an emerging plant-based company to bring them into your fold, ultimately sell that product, extend your product line, but also shape that product to, to the best ability that you might have. So you feel it's, although it's not seafood, it's representative of seafood. My big problem, John, is the fact that it's not seafood. Santa Monica seafood is almost exclusively seafood. And for us to include uh, one, uh, I, I separate the cell cultured from the plant based. Cell culture, like I said, I think it could be an opportunity. I like everything I've read thus far, but it's still to be proven. Uh, and I'm optimistic from what I have read. On the plant based, um, if we, if Santa Monica Seafood, which is known exclusively for seafood, and our calling cards are, you know, quality, food safety, environmental and social responsibility, uh, 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 healthy, nutritious products, uh, I think we'd be uh, feeding the myth, if you will, giving credibility to their claim that they are seafood. Uh, Chad, you mentioned transpar transparency a number of times in your comments. And I have to say, looking at your products, uh, turning them over, uh, looking at the ingredients, I think they're better than most that I've seen in the imitation seafood sector. I like the algae oil that's in there. Uh, but again, if I look at transparency, your comment, I look at the front of the package, because that's most of what uh, consumers look at. And in big bold letters, I see the word tuna on three of the six packages that I've seen. Um, three of them were different kinds of tuna. Uh, mm -hmm. Tuna was the big bold letter. In smaller, different font, different uh, style was the word fishless. Well, don't tell me what you don't have, tell me what you do have in these products. Um, like you said yourself, uh, the top five or six ingredients are different kinds of uh, legumes. Nowhere is that mentioned in the, in the, the front of the pack. It's the front of the pack, Roger. It says six legume blend, protein blend, so. Okay, I'm sorry that I missed that. Uh, but the big bold word is tuna, right? Um, Joseph, I want to I want to throw you in the middle of this <laughs> because you are somewhat in the middle of this. Um, you you know you have a legacy with with seafood, obviously, and now you're you're stepping into the cell based and maybe the plant based at some point as well. So, how do you how do you handle this uh, middle ground of kind of bridging the old and the new? What what's your outlook? Sure. And I think, I think it's an interesting debate. It's fairly fundamental. It, this is a great example of how this plays out more broadly, I would say. Um, I think, you know, for us, uh, we don't see this naturally, naturally as a conflict. So to, back to the title of, of the panel, is it a threat or an opportunity? We think it's, 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 it's definitely an opportunity. Of course, uh, existing 
value chains will be impacted in some shape or form by this, but also by many other things. On the, but on, on balance, this is an opportunity. Um, in light of the, the, the growing demand for protein, uh, we need all the sources that we can get. And it's not either uh, a choice for, for, for a traditional seafood or an, an alternative for seafood. It could be both. You know, it's the, the either or, um, I think, classification uh, leads to this well, type of debate that's not always, not always constructive. Uh, we're a firm believer that it, it can be and, 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 and uh, there's lots of synergies between the existing uh, supply chains and the new ones. So um, for us, this is an activity that we add on top of everything else. So we're still very much in the feed business, right? Our division, Scretting, is a, is a leading supplier of, of, um, of aqu feed to aquaculture, and we remain committed to that business. That is still um, our, our bread and butter. Um, we'll keep doing that, and we remain committed to uh, delivering high-quality nutritional solutions to our uh, customers in aquaculture and in livestock farming. But at the same time, we embrace that there's opportunities to be had in, in new forms of protein production with new uh, value chain shaping up. But we believe that our uh, capabilities and uh, the things that we do well in our existing value chains like sourcing ingredients, like, like setting up supply chains, like ensuring quality and safety, um, all those things could also be relevant in, in new value chains. So um, you know, one can really go um, hand in hand with the other. And earlier you asked, you know, what is what is it that set Blue and Lua apart in cell base? Well, one of the aspects is the inclusive approach, right? And I think that's also something that stands out in the, in the discussion we had so far. You can you can wage a crusade as an entrepreneur saying, well, I'm against you, or I think I do everything better. Oh, frozen. frozen. <laughs> Lou, I'm, like uh, uh, yeah, I will shoot it to you. Did you have a comment? And you, and then you all have no partners. Um, and also as an existing player in the value chain, you can say. You're freezing up. I'm going to throw it to Lou for a sec, Yost. Your, your, mono, or your video is freezing. All right. I, I just want to make a follow-up on, on Yost's comment, John. Um, okay. And so, something we haven't talked about today is, is consumer. You know, obviously consumers are seeking products that, that meet the needs of sustainability. They're looking for products uh, that, that can really help keep, uh, in this case, fish in the ocean and animals on land. Uh, and, and, you know, and consumers, uh, I think as Chad mentioned, are increasingly flexitarian in their choices. So consumers will continue to seek uh, seafood from conventional sources, from plant-based sources, and ultimately from cell-based sources. You know, and, and, and as you also mentioned, we need to find new solutions to feed the planet in the decades to come. I think another, another commentary is food security. As we're dealing with this uh, post-pandemic world here, or current pandemic world, you know, we need to have a more stable supply chain. So you know, uh, companies like uh, that provide cell-based or plant-based solutions are creating some stability um, and another choice for food service operators and, and retailers to have uh, other options to feed their, their consumers. And again, consumers are seeking that. And of course, food service operators are looking for, again, a stable supply chain with more consistent pricing. Um, and, and God forbid there's an algae bloom or an environmental disaster and seafood's not available at a certain species level, you know, we can actually provide that complement to the supply chain. So, so back to the objective of the, of, you know, the title of this talk, it's all about you know, working in partnership with, with seafood industry. That's clearly our stance of Bunalu coming up with a, another supply chain solution um you know and, and that's uh, and even follow up on yosa's comments uh, uh we just need to find new solutions you know labeling is a whole nother topic obviously cell-based and plant-based you know might have a different solution to that labeling question but we're all in the same mission to give consumers another option yeah well, i think the consumer yep. is an important one um i read some research that said 40 um, percent of consumers eat plant-based uh products to avoid processed foods. Well, the truth is with plant-based imitation seafood, it's ultra processed. Um, obviously they don't know that. Uh, another good thing about consumers that I like to throw on the table is um, NFI commissioned an outside study, uh, used a major research firm out of Chicago who um, uh, went out and uh, found, I think a thousand different uh, primary grocery uh, buyers. And shockingly, 40% of the consumers, when they were shown different packages of plant-based products, uh, thought that the plant-based seafood products um, contained fish. Almost 40% of people thought that. That says something about the labeling to me. 
Uh, second, 50, almost 50% 50 of those same consumers that were surveyed thought the nutritional value of the plant-based products was equal to or greater than the nutritional value of seafood. Uh, and they thought that there were similar types of proteins and, and omega-3 uh, benefits in both the plant-based and the seafood. Um, I don't agree with any of that. And that's research that was done uh, not by the industry, but by an outside group. Chad, I just want to uh, ask you, your, your colleagues in the plant-based world, um, have they seen what you're, you're doing with Bumblebee and talk to you about how you did that? Is, is that like a model going forward for your colleagues and your competitors even in, in this space? Um, I think it's certainly a model. I think that it's uh, it's more a model for the larger companies to be seeking out to diversify their portfolio. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, I, I used uh, I used Maple Leaf as a prime example. Um, I mean, massive, massive animal ag company. And they are they started a company called Greenleaf, which is uh, Brought in all of their plant-based uh, plant-based brands under that under under that that brand. So um, they've you know they're seeing it as as uh, the need to diversify when it comes to uh, protein sources. You know um, you know because they they see the environmental issues that that their industry has has and the shortages that may come and the fluctuation of prices as Lou had mentioned. So um, I think that. You know, certainly our colleagues within the plant-based sector are seeing that benefit of working with, uh, you know, those incredible partners with dis distribution weight, um, such as Bumblebee. Uh, but also, I think it, it it's a great example of uh, of a legacy company and a in a large company that's that's looking to diversify in order to, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, Roger, totally right. I mean, it's their bottom line, right? So it's um, if it's going to, you know, they they can't miss out on this opportunity, you know. Um, right. You know, and I see a lot of those companies, uh, you know, some of the largest meat companies in the world have jumped on and, and it's starting with seafood. And I think it's, uh, you know, this bumblebee relationship is, uh, is, is truly a, a prime example. And, and Jan says it, says it so well. I mean, she had mentioned, um, you know, uh, you know, that their commitment uh, to sustainable fishing has been actively working to manage fish stocks across their portfolio. And this partnership certainly helps do that. So, um, and and I, I highly respect her and the, the executive team over at Bumblebee. I mean, what she's done with the company in the past couple of years has been incredible for the culture and the direction of the company. So, um, yeah, I just, I can't say how much, how thrilled we are to be partnering. So, um, and it's a prime example, you know. I think it is natural for the big billion dollar companies to diversify. They all do it. And I mean, look at Pacific Seafood. They're a billion dollar seafood company and they're known as a seafood company but they sell an awful lot of chicken, beef, and pork. How about yeah. Tyson, which is invested, I think, in some of these companies here. Tyson's a mega billion dollar food company. Um, for decades and decades, they were a chicken company, period. You know, now they're into all the beef, pork, and um, everything. Uh, it's only natural for them to diversify. It's how they reduce risk. I mean, my God, here we are in the middle of a coronavirus crisis, and it's the companies that uh, have diversified uh, out of food service like Santa Monica did years ago to get into retail. Thank heavens we did that. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the clock, everyone, and uh, I think it's time for Drew to join us. He has some questions from the audience, but as this debate is demonstrated right here, it's it's a fascinating debate and there's so much technology and new innovation happening in this space that we'll be, you know, we'll be covering this for a while, obviously. But uh, Drew, if you, can you hear me? Absolutely. All right. Uh, yeah, we, we have quite a list of questions here and some are so far over my head that I'm just going to have to direct them. Uh, I'm just going to have to send them your way because some of them have to do with amino acids and all kinds of things and formulas. So we have running from that the specific uh, area all the way over to um, to some basics uh, about uh, flavor profile and how these products are, are put together. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, that has come up is the the commercialization of these products because there is a very uh, limited amount on the market right now but obviously and this is going to kind of go to to um to you yos and to you dominique but 
obviously, um, commercialization is the biggest challenge, and, and I'm assuming that's why uh, Nutreco Ventures wants to give uh, a, a little bit of a, a leg up to, to Blue Nalu and um, Dominique um, Tyson Ventures investing into uh, New Wave as well. So the question I have, and Dominique will start with you, and I know you're having some connection problems and just want to let the audience know that uh, we'll make sure that we have uh, all this uh, all this coverage and follow up with with interviews. So if you miss anything, we'll make sure and uh, and get you um, uh, some more in depth interviews with these folks. But Dominique, can you tell us just a little bit about that Tyson partnership? And is the ultimate goal then to use the supply chain and the production capabilities of a group like Tyson to be able to produce new wave products? Uh, you know, I think I could speak to what I believe is a bigger opportunity for partnership between traditional seafood and processing seafood and plant-based is is there. Um, it's within the manufacturing and within the distribution. So a partnership between a company like New Wave and Tyson could unlock some of those things that would have been harder to achieve on our own. Um, it, it's one thing to create everything at, at a uh, scale in a lab level like Lou and Roger had mentioned engine and it's another thing to maintain that same quality at a commercialized level um, and we were able to do that at new way we went from this bench top prototype producing about 30 pounds a month up to about a thousand pounds a month by scaling with uh, contract manufacturers and uh, that was capacity constrained so the partnership and the opportunity that i see immediately are potentially working with the seafood processing uh, manufacturers and the plant-based companies coming together. There are some spots that may arise where a lot of the um, authenticity, the texture, the magic, if you will, in some of these products come from the manufacturing side and the companies may not want to disclose or share what that is. So there may be some limitations in that partnership. So it was really a challenge to get your bench top great product to scale and into retail or food service. And one way to accelerate that is a partnership with one of these bigger uh, companies. And then I'm curious too, and, and like I said, then I'll kick it over to you, Yost, in a second. But Dominique, um, when you sort of began uh, raising your profile and raising New Wave and, and what you were doing, I'm curious from private equity, VC, angel investors, uh, and of course, big, you know, big industrial folks like Tyson, how much interest was there in what you were were doing? My sense is that it is uh, significant, that there's a lot of people that want to put money into this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you're right on. We were receiving a, a ton of interest, generated a lot of press, a lot of coverage. Again, we were one of the first players coming out saying, we're going to do a plant-based shrimp alternative that really hasn't been done at this level. There was you know, a lot of konjac and um, you know, kind of a, the vegan alternatives for a long time, but nobody's really looking to replicate the, sh the muscle fibers of shrimp and give you an authentic shrimp experience. Uh, and that piqued the interest of investors ranging from angel investors all the way up to VCs and these bigger industry partners. Um, and from many perspectives too, some people are aligned um, with the vision and the mission of the company from a plant-based perspective or from a sustainability perspective. Uh, some of the investors are aligned because they really believe and diversifying protein sources to help protect the future of our oceans um, and other looking at it as a way to make money. And this is a growing trend in the food space and they wanted to get involved in that as well. Great, and, and Joost, um, from Nutreco's perspective as well, obviously uh, incredibly diversified. Uh, the largest uh, feed company in the world is a part of Nutreco's portfolio, uh, Scredding. Um, and into into grain, into all types of sectors. To what extent do these agri giants then need to be thinking in this pan protein uh, pan protein way? Do, will it be inevitable that the Tyson's, that the major companies, including the major seafood companies, will need to have a portfolio of proteins rather than focusing down and drilling down on one is that where the future is going in terms of, of larger companies um 
Yeah, I think many of the major companies have embraced the 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 the, the you know protein um, source agnostic focus, if you will, right? So Tyson was mentioned. I think BHW was mentioned by Chad. Um, if you look at companies that do uh, production and distribution, I think many of the larger players have embraced that. I think we're a bit earlier in the value chain. We're specifically focused on the feed side, on the input side, and I think there it's it's a bit less, um, it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit more rare to do so. Um, but you know, there will always be a place for specialization. Um, if but of course, uh, uh, if you do if you do what you do very well, um, there is a business in that. Um, the downside of that there is just less resilience, and I think that's something that we're seeing in the current uh, uh, market environment. So I'm not sure there's any single way or one strategy that everybody should follow. Um, there is an approach that, that fits uh, um, every every type of capability in company, I would say. I can only speak to, to the approach that we are taking. And we, we, we believe that you know, there's lots of virtue in being protein source agnostic um, and, and looking carefully at what we can do well and seeing how that translates to, to other protein sources and what we can do there. And I think that's also the the base of our partnership with Luna Lu. We're not focused on distribution, but we're focused on uh, setting up a supply chain, uh, looking at inputs that we can provide to them, looking at the opportunity of, of providing that market as an ing ingredient supplier um, to sell based. Um, and we are of the firm belief that, you know, given the protein challenge that's there, um, we can't solve that using the tools of the past. This requires innovation. If you want to do innovation well, um, you have to do it together, right? No party hold, no single party holds all the pieces to that puzzle because it's just too complex. So uh, it really for, um, requires collaboration, new partnerships, looking at uh, parties that have the same mindset with a different set of capabilities and finding a way to align that. And that's tricky and challenging, but if you get it right, we believe there's great potential. And I think that's what we're also finding with uh, with, with the work that we're now doing with Luna Loop. So, Chad, over to you, Zoe. This was a really interesting question, which I think one of the uh, one of the questions that we've got um, several times was, uh, and I guess it's in the spirit of collaboration, is why aren't there blends, for example? Y you mentioned uh, you mentioned Surimi. Is there a possibility down the road where we would see blended products, where there would be some plant base blended in with uh, with seafood to get those omega threes? And I know Dominique, you've done a little bit of this on the algae side, but Chad, do you see that, or do you see these uh, as serving different sets of consumers? No, I, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's already being done, as I mentioned, over in China and India when it comes to the tuna industry. As I mentioned, I mean, there's uh, you know, 70 to 90 percent. I mean, I can't dial exactly the percentage, but it's a very high percentage of canned tuna is soy protein already. Uh, the reason I know that is we know very well one of the Thai manufacturers of those products. Um, so there is certainly a, a huge opportunity there, you know, um, you know, because right now it's just soy. So one of the advantages that we have with Good Catch is that it is a six legume blend and we've really worked on that layering of flakiness with the with the proteins with our extrusion process so um i don't see there anything wrong with um with a blended product um it probably won't be under the good catch brand but we're certainly open to those conversations with potential partners so you know if you look at the meat industry there's uh there's a lot of blended products that are happening right now so when it comes to mushrooms and when it comes to soy and um other other uh, textured proteins so it sounds to me like, you know, and this was a, another great question that came up was there's this general feeling that there will be certainly with in the short term with coronavirus, there'll be some uh, a, a bit of a potential meat shock. I think we all saw the headlines about um, some of the uh, fast food chains not having the ability to sell hamburgers, uh, for example. So there's a lot of questions here about whether or not um, seafood would benefit from that versus plant-based uh, or cell-based seafood. And um, Roger, maybe this goes to, to you. I mean, is there, with this shortage, this uh, this need to fill the, the protein space uh, as we go forward in the future, um, what, what, what do you see? You've expressed concern about uh, plant-based seafood as a as a potential threat, but um, let's look down the road a bit. Do you see uh, which of these sectors do you see filling some of those gaps? Well, I think short term, right now, with all the closures of the you know pork and beef processing plants that we've all read and heard about, um, it is has definitely created an opportunity for everybody else. People are looking for protein. Uh, when customers go to the stores, 
um, you know, what's, what's on the counter, what's on the shelf that they can grab and go. Uh, where it's what has really helped it has been, uh, uh, you know, skin pack products, for example. A lot of the grocers closed down their, uh, their uh, uh, butcher blocks. Uh, they needed the people filling the shelves. Uh, the people didn't want to go face to face with the consumer. A um, lot of issues there. So whatever was wrapped up and ready to pick up in the stores, uh, people were picking up. Meat um, and pork have been scarce recently. Uh, has it helped our seafood sales because of that? Yes, it has. Uh, will it help uh, plant-based uh, imitation seafood at the same time or, or plant-based imitation meat at the same time? Yes, I think it has. Although I, I can't tell you how many people have told me, geez, I've gone to the store and, and everybody's picking up all the meat and all the pork and all the chicken and all the fish. And all I see left over is that imitation meat stuff. Um, I don't hear about the seafood because there's just not that much of, of it out there yet. Um, and, and they seem to, what I'm hearing, right or wrong, is that, okay, at last resort, if all, all I have is that imitation meat, I'll take it and try it. Um, but short term, it's going to help. Uh, will that stay there long term? First, I don't think so. I think once all the beef and pork and chicken is back uh, and stocked uh, heavily, I think people will, will revert to their old ways. Well, then there's some fantastic questions coming through. So the audience is really uh, is really engaged. That's always great. Um, Dominique, one of the questions that's being asked here is scale. And there's uh, there's a question here about whether or not uh, these products are really scalable, uh, be it algae or, or be it uh, cells. What, what does it take to actually get these up to production levels for, where you can actually commercialize? It, it differs uh, for each product. You know, I think each product has its own unique process and then translating that into a scaled process takes a lot of time and engineering and expertise. Um, you know, for a shrimp product, for example, we were doing everything by hand, which made the product great, but it wasn't scalable. It made it very costly to continue to produce it that way. So figuring out ways to incorporate automation and bigger machines, again, while trying to maintain the quality is the challenge. Um, I'm sure Lou can speak to the the future that he sees in terms of scaling cellular agriculture and developing those products. But for plant-based, it certainly is looking at the inputs. So where are your ingredients coming from and are they there to scale with what you think you're, you're going to need to make to meet demand and grow as a company? And based on our research and what we've done with New Wave, and I'm sure Chad can mention this too, like the plant-based proteins are abundant and available enough to support a scale of these seafood alternatives. Um, and then it's just a manner a, a manner of figuring out what is that scaled process. And again, like I mentioned before, I think there's an opportunity working with these larger seafood manufacturers to increase scale. But then there's that caveat of do do the plant based seafood companies or the cellular companies want to disclose some of their um, proprietary secrets? And so then it comes to uh, the choice of do you manufacture your own facility or you create your own manufacturing facility and then that's a different business model which requires a lot more capital so that's that's where i see it and that's the two paths to, to distill it down to two simple options is do you find a manufacturing partner that can help you scale and get out there quickly or do you go down the path where you build your own facility which gives you more control over your r d and your production but is more capital intensive and can take longer to get online Right, and maybe we can kick that to, to you as well, uh, Lou, since that um, obviously, obviously very different processes. Um, what does it really take in terms of CapEx, in terms of time to get these things ultimately to the shelf? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, what, we, what we consider large-scale manufacturing um, looks a bit like a microbrewery meeting a conventional food processing facility, meaning large stainless steel tanks of uh, growing uh, various cell types that go through various forms of extrusion or layering to create the finished product that is then potentially grill mark, smoked, seared, sauteed, you know, or sold in the raw state, you know, you know consistent with, with conventional uh, seafood processing. The beauty is we're, um, we're creating these factories close to market um, replacing what might be, you know, three, five, seven, nine thousand miles shipment 
you know, containers and, and air freight and, and, and ocean freight, et cetera, with maybe a 60% yield at the food service level, replace 100% yield uh, at, you know, because we're just selling the boneless, skinless, <coughs> headless, tailless filet. <coughs> so in terms of scale, um, it's something that um, we're very excited by because it really is all about conventional manufacturing processes, <coughs> excuse me, that we're applying here uh, that um, kind of are, are the same kind of manufacturing process using, uh, you know, uh, you know, some of the same uh, utility requirements, et cetera, you might see in the, uh, 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 the uh, Coke, Pepsi or Anheuser-Busch kind of factory models uh, that are also close to market. I think we're also part of our scale is uh, we talked about our partnership with uh, with Yost and, and then the Treco team, <clears throat> very key on the supply chain side. We're similarly partnering with Griffith Foods um, on the supply chain side, helping us to optimize um, the flavor texture profile that that uh, is, is consistent with uh, seafood. We're also partnering with um, uh, Sumitomo in Japan, Pomwan in South Korea, and also Rich Products in USA. Uh, as partners that could really help us on operations, sales, marketing, distribution. So, you know, key to our success is, is having these partnerships in place, but also having these factories that can produce uh, products close to market. And the beauty of our operation too, is it's very variable and flexible. If, uh, if a product, uh, uh, some seafood commodity is not available for a certain time period, we can switch one species off and switch another species on because we're literally creating a platform technology with a wide array of species that are available, essentially a library um, that we can actually uh, suit to market demand or some, some, some variation in supply that might exist at any given time. So it really creates a very scalable and very flexible model. Yeah. So can the, I just, in real quick? Oh, go ahead, can I in, Yeah, just real quick around commercialization because we're kind of right in the thick of it with good catch. So, um, you know, as Dominique had mentioned, this two pass. I mean, working with co-packers and starting around factory, we found that there we were just running into walls of, of um, you know, there's not many co-packers that are able to produce plant-based protein in the U.S. that are opening up their facility, um, and certainly not a lot of startups that want to give up that IP. So uh, we felt it necessary to raise the necessary capex to to launch our own facility and to build it from ground up. So we, as I mentioned, we're in under commissioning right now. We're going to go into full pro, full blown production in about a month. We have a 45,000 square foot facility. And really, I mean, most of the cops, most of the costs for any food production is, is downline. I mean, we're using the same IQF freezers, the same formers, the same choppers, the same seasoning tumblers um, as the seafood industry or as, as, as any food manufacturing company would. It's just, uh, you know, creating that initial protein um, is where the specialty falls into play. And with our product, is in it, it's, it's uh, HME, which is high moisture extrusion. So, um, but really, I mean, you know, to your point, Lou, it's, uh, there's huge benefit to, um, to little to no waste. I mean, from our end, from a plant-based standpoint, and, and Roger, maybe you can school us a little bit, um, is, you know, I don't know what the percentage of, of waste is with seafood, but it's, it's got to be 30, 40% or so when, when it comes to um, bones and biparts and things like that. So um, the 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 great thing about these factories with plant based uh, commercialization is that is there's very little to no waste and and the val and, and the opportunity with value add products downline is is enormous. So, well, my question for Lou would be, how are you going to educate the consumer? Uh, because I think at least myself as a consumer and I think many others hear about these you know cell cultured. And I envision the, these men and women in these white la white coats sitting in a laboratory in front of a pet petri dish, and the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, Jurassic Park, and 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 the fossil the fossil cells that uh, they turn into real dinosaurs, if you will. Or I think of the gamma radiation that turned Bruce Banner into the Green Hulk. Um, you know, I don't mean to be funny about it, but. Um, cell cultured and everything that goes along with it, those are the types of images that come to mind. And how, you know, it's, look what the um, GMO salmon, salmon went through. That was a horrendous effort and I don't think they're still there. How are you gonna get people educated? Because my concern is the cost of doing that. Anytime you're trying to market anything, um, the seafood industry happens to be small. They're not what I would call a rich industry and uh, the dollars to educate the consumer are horrendous. And I think you have a challenge there. Um, 
and I, and I don't know how you can overcome it. Well, yeah, first of all, first of all, Roger, as a person who's been in my whole career in the food industry, I don't think people talk too much about how hot dogs are made, how processed cheese is made, how yogurt's made. You know, people will get over the fact of the process, and people initially were concerned about in vitro fertilized child. You know, uh, Louise yeah. Brown was the first person. Um, she was a bit of an anomaly, but now uh, the concept of having uh, a baby born a new way is uh, is obviously uh, widely adopted. So. It's not an issue at all, Roger, in terms of uh, the process. Um, and first of all, we're totally dedicated to transparency. We're working in full disclosure with the FDA and, com and communicating everything that we're doing so the proper regulations can be held. We want consumers to know that it's cell-based and not wild-caught or farm-raised because we want them to prefer it. And we think that they will because it's a new solution that, that, that supports sustainability, that also provides a product without mercury, microplastics, or any environmental pollutants. And it's something that consumers are seeking. So we're not at all concerned about consumer adoption. In fact, we're very, uh, very excited by it. We've already done consumer research and found a great deal of interest at the, at the food service opera, operator level um, who, are, who are finding benefits, not only for their consumers and, and providing health benefits, um, but also providing a sustainability commitment for their restaurant operation, but also a product with reduced labor um, higher yield, longer shelf life, um, so and product that's consistently available. So we're finding excitement at all levels, and consumers similarly are are finding uh, this product and um, to be very approachable. You know, so we're we're not concerned about uh, concerned at all about early adopters. And I think, frankly, Roger, uh, the plant-based category has opened people's eyes to alternative proteins. You know, plant-based uh, products have have uh, have obviously done very well. We've heard about Beyond Meat and Apostle Foods and, and many others that are now launching on the seafood side um, and more on the plant-based side, on the meat side as well. But so so consumers are, are, are awakened for a more sustainable solution, whatever the reason is for preferring those products or, or at least giving them a try. Um, so we're very confident that cell-based uh, will, will be similarly uh, really easily adopted without a whole lot of marketing requirements. Um, we're already seeing a great deal of interest from the media and obviously our consumer research we've done so far has been extraordinarily favorable. Okay. So one of the things that's come up here at the, the question several times is, um, is, is asking us to look a bit away from sort of the downstream battle in the marketplace uh, over market share. And Yost, I'm going to go to you on this. Uh, a couple of questions about China and about Africa in terms of how these products have the potential to help uh, change the landscape there for protein. So can you talk just a little bit about uh, about that and give us a, a bit of a global context for where um, cell-based and plant-based and alternative uh, proteins might play a role? Sure, I'll, I'll give that a try. I think to to the question that Roger raised earlier, I think the protein challenge is 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 more stark or more pronounced in some some regions compared to others, right? I think China was one of the examples where the demand for protein is very big and the, the supply is just not sufficient. And I think in Africa at this moment in time, it's the same way. Um, at the same time, um, you know, the, the especially when you look at the African context, um, you know, there is there's going to be a, a measure of cost involved, right? And I think you know. Hopefully, uh, Lou, uh, time will tell differently. But at, at the current moment in time, you know, cell base cannot really compete on the basis of cost uh, with with traditional uh, um, sources. And I think for plant based, you know, that depends on the technology a bit. But that's also a challenge. I think you know, the the way we are seeing that shape up currently is, you know, especially in markets where consumers have strong preference around uh, sustainability. You know, that's where you see alternative protein sources um, taking flight and growing more rapidly in in places. In the West, in in the uh, in the U.S., in Europe, um, in some other markets as well, whereas other markets you know are expected to follow. And I think also in Asia, where where seafood consumption is is much bigger, and in some countries you see a lot large uptick in in the, um, uh, the, the impact of sustainability uh, in, in consumer preferences. I also see potential there um, for for this to uh, really take shape and um, and a put, make a foothold in Africa. You know, I think the the cost will have to come down, and that is really a matter of scale, right? So I think some technologies within plant based or cell based could have the potential to to really um, uh, be very cost efficient at, at very um, extensive in, intensive scales. 
um, what which those are, I think that's that's it's still too, too early to tell. I think the industry is really in the early stages of development. Um, this ha so this has global potential in my in my mind, but it will be the average view um, where it will grow faster in some geographies than uh, than it will in others. Yeah, yeah. Can I follow that with a question? You mentioned China a number of times, and maybe this is better for someone like Chad. Um, Chad, I was happy to read on your website that um, all your various uh, pea proteins, I'll call them. Um, come from, I think, Europe and the U.S. and other places. Um, I'm concerned with uh, relations with China going forth because of what we're um, into right now with China. Um, but I have read that China is, I believe, the largest producer of all these pea proteins. I know Beyond Meat signed an agreement not long ago where 85% of their pea proteins are um, uh, grown and produced in China. Um, I don't know if the consumers are going to like that. Um, we don't import or export for all practical purposes with China ourselves. I know the seafood industry does as a whole, but how do you see that China factor impacting your product line? Maybe not your company, but your product line, because I, gotta I have to believe that a lot of these legumes um, are grown there. I know they are. Um, ours in particular, in terms of our six legume blend, there's a very small percentage, and I'm talking like under 20% that is that is grown in China. And I would have to get that number exactly from our, our R&D team. But we have uh, we have really made it a point to um, to really focus on you know a lot of North American grown product as well as European products. So, um, but the demand, I mean, back to what you had mentioned, Yost, I mean the the demand in China for protein and for plant based protein in particular is is growing massively. I mean, we have we have um, some incredible investors out of Japan that just came into Series B, um, so that will be opening the 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 doors to to that part of the, the world. And so, um, I think the uh, when it comes to relations of how things are changing with import export, I mean that's something that we're gonna not really be able to see uh, until until we're actually exporting. I mean, personally, um, uh, with around good catch, but. I mean, we know the demands there. We know the supply chain is could get interrupted and, and is getting interrupted at times, um, but we're not we're not worried about that with our our personal supply chain around good catch. So I don't see a problem with the export. It's mainly the import um, yeah. of, of supply products and, yeah. and consumers not acceptance potentially of it's from China. Yeah, well, I think I think being able to diversify our protein sources of where they're from um, outside of China is is necessary. But we are looking at manufacturing capabilities uh, in a number of different spots of the world, so we aren't focused on import export constantly um, when it comes to global distribution. I mean, we we set out on the on our initial investment um, with this company as a as a global company. Um, you know, I believe it took nine years for for Beyond Meat to enter the European market and and to leave North America and. And year one for us, I mean, we're in 5,000 doors in the U.S. and we've just opened up a number of other countries this year, uh, which we're going to be exporting also to um, um, and looking at manufacturing facilities in different parts of the world and China being one of them. So we'll see how that all plays out. But that's part of uh, our our investor portfolio and what they're what they're intending. Um, yeah, so it's uh, there is there is some concern that we should have. I mean, in looking to the future of supply chain, but again, we're in a we're in a, a good position right now when it comes to our sourcing. So, so so folks, we we unfortunately do have to start wrapping it up soon. There's one other question, and I have to apologize to Lou, Chad, Yos, and Roger because there there was an assumption, and to John, because there's an assumption made, Dominique, that that you are are younger, and so somebody is uh, somebody wants to know as a consumer. Uh, and, and I happen to know from, from talking to Dominique last week that she's also a, a relatively new mom. Um, but as a consumer, um, they want to know uh, how do you see your shopping and how do you see cell-based and plant-based and uh, different proteins as part of your uh, shopping habits? I'm flattered. People are curious about my personal shopping habits. <laughs> Um, and as a new mom, it definitely brings that under the microscope even more. I was very mindful of what I ate before being a mother, but now it's, it's very important, it, it, more than ever, to know where my food is coming from and what I'm putting on the plate, albeit my kids will always prefer french fries over everything else. So, uh, you know, personally, I do look at traceability and the source of where my food is coming from, that's produce too. Um, I've been very fortunate to live in big metropolitan areas that have access to 
an abundance of different types of foods. Um, in terms of protein, uh, seafood, those sorts of things, you know, the more and more uh, we grow as a society, the more and more I think algae-based proteins are going to be really important for us. The more plant-based proteins come online. And I think if you can run a script of all of the dialogue today, you would hear the word diversify come up over and over and over again. Diversify the proteins in our products ourselves. Chad just mentioned that. Diversify the source of the proteins. Even Rogers diversified the types of proteins that he serves. So for us, and for me as a shopper, it's diversity and and the proteins that I bring to my plate. So always looking for traceability, sustainability, quality, and it has to taste great so the kids can eat it. Great. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to John really, uh, really quickly, John, for you to do just a, a brief wrap up and then I'll uh, finish off with some concluding remarks after that. I wish we could go uh, longer, but with the, the debate and discussions will continue on the uh, on the, the pages, so to speak, of intrafish.com. So, John. Well, yep. Thanks, Drew. I want to thank the panelists. I think this was a, a wonderful discussion and just what we had hoped for. So, Thank everybody for their candor and their openness about the, these issues. And it's it's an amazing trend that is reshaping uh, protein across the globe. So we're glad to play a part in educating people about it. Um, we'll be reporting on this event. We'll have it um, we'll have it recorded and presented as a video later on. So um, you'll be able to catch up if you missed any parts of it. So. Um, yeah, again, thanks everybody. Thanks for all those who attended. I know we had a full house, so that makes me smile. So, uh, Drew, I'll leave it to you. Or maybe Great. I won't. <laughs> well, you, know, you, can, you can leave it to me. So uh, I'm not on screen, but you guys can all hear my voice. And just to echo, John, thank you so much. We had so many, uh, we, we had so many um, fantastic uh, people with so many fantastic backgrounds. So really, really appreciate you taking part. It's a fascinating discussion, especially in a time where everybody's looking for, for how we can expand that protein portfolio. Uh, and uh, and where seafood's going to play a role and where, where these other uh, proteins are as well. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we will have another webinar coming up next uh, next month. Um, Intrafish is, uh, we uh, are known for our live events, but obviously that's not going to happen for a while. Uh, we hope for, for everybody, for all of us soon, that we'll be able to Get out of our homes and first see our friends and family but then after that go out and see the the industry so we'll be doing uh, more of these um hopefully everyone enjoyed taking a little bit of a break from uh coronavirus uh coverage i know that's changed everybody's personal lives and professional lives and uh and it will continue to uh be sort of a shadow over over all these plans um but again we'll we'll look forward to having more people join us uh thank you all again uh, and we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing uh, more of you in the, in the near future. So thank you again. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Great discussion. Enjoyed it.